Well, as you're being seated, I want you to notice here, and I think we got a slide of this. Today I'm wearing a new tie. This tie was uh, given to me by some folks here in our church, and it's an armor of God tie. So you can't see all the details in here, but it has all of the verses from the armor of God on here. It has all the different parts of the armor, etc. I thought that was a pretty cool gift. Isn't that a, a neat gift? Yeah. Now, I was sitting in my office this morning. I said, I've got to wear this because uh, this might actually be the last day of our series on the armor of God. I say might. I never know what's going to happen, but that's the plan. And I was thinking, what a great gift, because it quotes God's word. What a great thing to have something that reminds you of the word of God. And I thought it was also a great gift because it illustrates each piece of the armor. And quite frankly, it's attractive too, I must say. <laughs> and so I was thinking about that, but this morning, having received this a week or two ago, this morning was the first time I put it on. And I was sitting in my office wearing it thinking, that's a metaphor of our spiritual lives. God has given us so many resources, so many gifts that he wants us to appropriate. And so often they sit, we don't put them on. Think of the gifts God's given us. James 1.17 says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Ephesians 1.3, God has blessed us with how many? Every, all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1.3 says that he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. God always gives good gifts. That's the only kind of gifts he gives. And he gives, he gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And to that end, he gave us every spiritual blessing. You have it all. The question is, will you appropriate it? Will you use those resources to win the battle day by day for the glory of God? And that's what we want to learn. The question is how. And that's what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, because God has given us his very armor. This is the armor of God. This is the armor God uses. When the God-man came to earth, Isaiah foretold that he would put this very same armor on. When he says it's the armor of God, it's God's armor that he gives to us. And we went through all the different parts. We went through the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the, the feet shod with the preparation of peace and the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. We went through all of those parts and you see how this soldier is completely provided for. From head to toe, front, back, and side, he is protected by his armor. God has given us everything we need, 100% complete protection from the enemy and his attack. We do not need to fail, do we? But do we fail? We fail because we fail to appropriate. We don't have because we don't ask. And this is what God wants to drive into our hearts through the Apostle Paul as he wraps up this critical section of Ephesians. We've been looking at the last couple of weeks that it's through prayer we actually appropriate the armor for the battle. Samuel Chadwick made this great quote. Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep God's people from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. That's true. Prayerlessness does not scare the enemy at all. He knows how weak we are. Oswald Chambers said it this way, our ordinary views of prayer are not found in the New Testament. What a statement. You hear what he's saying? Most of the prayers offered today by Christians are found nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. That's quite a statement. Why? We look upon prayer as a means of getting things for ourselves. The Bible idea of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. It's not just the gift. Prayer is seeking the giver of the gift. 
having a deepening relationship with him that impacts every other area of life. And when we truly know God, we're compelled to pray and trust him for the impossible. George Mueller was known for this. He was a man who trusted God constantly as he fed orphans and did things, never asking for a thing, just going to God in prayer. He says this, I had a secret satisfaction in the greatness of the difficulties which were in the way. Right? You live that way? Yes? You consider it all joy when you encounter various what? Is that the way you live? I'm not hearing very many answers. George Mueller says, I got excited the more difficult life became. So far from being cast down on account of them, they delighted my soul, for I only desired to do the will of the Lord in this matter. The greater the obstacles, the more abundantly plain the truth that I had come to a right judgment if they were removed by prayer. I did nothing but what? Pray. Then he says this, prayer and faith, the universal remedies against every want and every difficulty, and the nourishment of prayer and faith, God's holy word helped me over all the difficulties. That's a great quote. It's that simple, folks. Satan hates it when you pray. He will do everything he can to keep you from praying. He will do everything he can to keep you from the word of God so you have the mind of God and you pray according to the spirit who inspired the word of God. He tries every which way to keep you from having a meaningful time daily or even multiple times daily with God in the word and in prayer. That's why it's such a struggle. That's why if most of you were being honest this morning, you would admit that you have not really had consistent times with the Lord for quite some time. Sporadic, occasionally good, not consistently. Those who are consistent are the ones where you typically see them bearing much fruit, especially the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. You notice the difference about them. They're not whining and complaining like Pastor Randy spoke on a few weeks back. They are living by faith, trusting God, giving him praise no matter what, and believing that he's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that you can ask or even think according to his power that works within us. Amen? You see those kinds of folks, and that ought to inspire you to say, okay, how do I get there? You get there by being in the word and in prayer. So with that in mind, the greatest difficulty I could think of that George Mueller might bring up wasn't the finances or the food that he needed for the orphans. It was the enemy of his soul. And to stand firm against him, we can't simply know about the armor of God. We can't just hang it up in the closet. We have to what? Put it on. Put it on. And that's through prayer. Just a quick reminder of what we've seen. We can see the structure of this passage very clearly by the commands and the participles, the what and the how. We saw in verses 14 through 16 that there was a command there to start standing firm. You do that by having girded, having shod, having put on, having taken up. Those participles tell you, how do I stand firm? I put on those first four parts of the armor of God and it's all something that I've already done. So what it's saying is what we just did in communion. When we partook of communion, we celebrated what has already happened in our lives. We were given the righteousness of Christ. We have been surrounded by truth. We have peace with God. We have faith in a Savior who's going to protect us all the way to the finish line. Those are facts. Amen? That's historical fact. You trusted in that. It happened. The transaction occurred. And you can now look back at that. And all that Christ did for you on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, what it assured for you, and you can stand firm in that. But then he goes on to the second half of the passage in verses 17 through 20, and there's a second command, and that command is to take up two things specifically. Start taking up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word. And we said that wasn't logos, it was rhema, the spoken word of God, the utterances of God, where you actually take specific truth out of the belt and apply it in that moment to the specific temptation or trial you're facing. And he says, you start taking that up. Now, get like this, not something that's happened in the past now, while praying, while being on the alert. I'm walking around in most of my armor. I've got everything. I've got the, the stuff. I've got the, the shield. But when the battle starts to rage, I've got to put on my helmet and take up my sword. 
Because in those moments, I have to have an eternal mind. I have to have my mind fixed on things above, or I'm going to get distracted, and I'm going to start making decisions based on things that are temporal. I have to take up God's word and speak it forth, either into my own heart and mind or even out loud if necessary, to deal with the particular thing I'm struggling with. And this is what he says, in the evil day. This is that intense moment where the battle is raging and the place where you've given in in the past. Now I've said, Lord, I need that helmet. I receive that helmet from you. I'm going to fix my mind on things above where Christ is seated. I'm going to live for the glory of God. This is not about me. This is not about my circumstances. It's about you. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus. And Lord, please give me the specific words to defend myself when he really comes lying to me. Does the devil ever lie to you? And have you ever noticed how sometimes it gets more intense? This is what Paul's talking about. This is how we win. And so with that in mind, and we've looked at all of this, we've looked at the taking up while we've looked at the while praying, while being on the alert, and we ended last time that you do that with all perseverance, obstinate persistence, with all petitions, specific and urgent, for all the saints. So how many of us need this kind of intercessory prayer? All of us. Wouldn't you be glad to know that there were other people in this body praying for you daily that you would put on the armor of God and go out and represent Christ and stand victorious? Would you, would you appreciate that? That's what Paul is saying. He's saying this to the body, y'all. Paul is from the South. And all of these are second person plural, y'all. I don't know what happened to the OU and y'all, but that just appeared. Y'all, y'all do this. How many of us are supposed to pray this way? All of us. How many of us are supposed to pray for everybody else this way? All of us. Imagine a church like that. Imagine this church being like that. Imagine knowing that every single member of this church was setting aside specific times of prayer multiple times a day to get before the Father and intercede on behalf of others, that we would all stand victorious representing Christ in this world. And when the devil attacks, we would all stand firm. Nobody would budge. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's what I want to see happen here. So with that in mind, let's then look at what Paul says in verses 19 and 20, because he doesn't change the subject. He says, for all the saints, and by the way, for me too. Verse 19, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, this is interesting. Because what Paul is saying here, and we often miss it, we think in verse 19 he changes the subject. We think up through verse 18 he's talking about the armor of God and praying for one another, and now he changes the subject to him. But that cannot be. Why can that not be? Because verses 14 through 20 is one sentence. All of this ties together. Now, some Greek translations would have verses 17 through 20 to be one sentence, 14 through 16. Either way, even if it's 17 through 20, whatever he is saying about taking up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, Paul is saying, pray it for me too. I, an apostle of Jesus Christ, need your prayers. Isn't that a great thing to hear? Have you ever thought you're the only weak one? You're the only one who struggles. Everybody else seems to have it together. I mean, for heaven's sake, we walk up and they're always smiling and praise the Lord and they're singing and they seem so joyful. And I'm sitting here going, I'm a worm and not a man. Anybody ever feel that way? I am so grateful that the Apostle Paul, who I consider to probably be, I don't know, but probably the most godly Christian in the history of mankind. If not, he's right up there. And he said, I need prayer. I need you to intercede for me that I would put on the helmet and take up the sword. See, how do you know he's saying that? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to just say this. If you need prayer to put on the armor of God to stand firm against the devil, do you think pastors do too? Do you think missionaries need this? See, I think we're guilty often of making very fatal assumptions. There was a photographer working for a national magazine. He was signed to get photos of a great forest fire. So he told those at the office, he said, hire a plane. So they did. And he went to the airport 
and he jumped into the plane. He said, let's go, let's go. And the pilot took off. He says, fly over the north side of the fire and make three or four low-level passes. And the pilot says, why? He says, I'm a photographer. I've got to take pictures. That's what photographers do. Oh, well, after a pause, the pilot said, you mean you're not the instructor? <laughs> Fatal assumption. He said, get me a plane. They got him a plane. They just didn't get him a pilot. Now listen, we're guilty of this. We make the tragic assumption that spiritual leaders are immune from problems in this life. That somehow they've arrived at a different spiritual plane, no pun intended, and that they know everything and they don't need more instruction. They've always got a great attitude. They are always in prayer. They are always taking time to study the word of God. Brothers and sisters, if the devil wants to keep you from the word in prayer, how much more does he want to keep leaders from the word in prayer? Would you understand that? This is critical to understand. We cannot make the assumption that pastors are out walking on the water in the morning having their quiet time. It doesn't happen. It's not true. Don't assume it. Don't assume their walk with God is easier than yours. Don't assume they always put on the full armor of God. Don't assume they don't struggle with sin just like everyone else. The reality is they probably need more prayer. Why? Because they're in the devil's crosshairs. I think we have another slide here. Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> right? When you take a position of spiritual leadership, you're putting a target on. And the fiery darts are aimed at you more than anyone else. Why? This, is a, this has always been a technique in war. If you want to discourage the soldiers, you go after the leaders. You take them out, you can take everybody. Haven't we seen this recently in the church? all across America and around the world, as these so-called spiritual leaders are now denouncing their faith, walking away from their marriages, engaging in all kinds of behavior that they used to preach against. It was a sham. They had the appearance of righteousness. With their lips they drew near to God, but their hearts were what? Far from Him. It's so easy to go down that path. You see, but I thought they were like super chicken. They knew their job was dangerous when they took it. But that doesn't mean they don't need your prayers. When I became a pastor, I had an idea of what was involved, and I knew it would cost. I knew there would be sacrifices, but I had no idea. No idea how hard it would be. And what pastors and missionaries don't need is a prayer, God bless the missionaries. So Paul, to drive home the reality that all of us need to take up, receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, uses himself as an example to end this whole paragraph. I want you to see that with me, all right? You with me now? Let's make some observations here. And by the way, I believe the reason true fellowship happens so rarely in the church today is because starting from the top down, we are reticent to reveal anything about ourselves, anything that's significant. We talk about the weather, we talk about the Dodgers, we talk about all kinds of stuff, but we don't talk about how we're really doing spiritually and how we desperately need each other's prayer. It's time for that to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. So before we go into the details, I want you to look at the context. Remember, this is one sentence. And I also want you to notice in verse 19, I don't know if we have the verse again. In verse 19, you notice the word and pray. This is a New American Standard, but most modern translations do this. When there is a word that the translator is inferring, it's not actually a Greek word that's there. They add it in italics. And notice the word pray is in italics. That has caused a number of people to think verse 19 and following is a new subject, but it's not. They're inferring that because Paul's command was to pray. And while praying, while you're doing that on behalf of everyone else, for me also. So that's the context. Paul needs to receive the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Now, I want to take those in their order, the helmet of salvation. So let's go to verse 20, and he says two things. That next, that next slide was right. 
He says, uh, for which I am an ambassador in chains at the first part of verse 20. And then in verse 20, he says, as I ought to speak. Now, what is it that ambassadors do? They speak on behalf of whom? Their country or their king or in those times, their, their Caesar, whomever. They are going as an emissary representing someone else, giving their message. It's the message of the person who sent them, not their own. And so what he is saying is, I need to go forth as an ambassador, and as an ambassador, I ought to speak. That's what I'm here for. That's what I should do. But guess what? It's hard. It's hard. Have you noticed how hard this is? 2 Corinthians 5 says that all of us are ambassadors for Christ. Amen? All of us are supposed to go forth representing the mystery of the gospel to people everywhere. Are we doing that regularly, consistently, and boldly? Probably not. Why? We're not taking these things up. See, if I take up the helmet of salvation, I am fixing my th eyes on things above. I am thinking about a time when I am going to be with Christ. This is future salvation. When I'm going to be glorified, I'm going to be with him. He receives all praise and glory and honor. And in that day, everybody who is saved will be there with him forever and ever and ever. But there's going to be a whole lot of people who are not there. Children from the elementary schools around us. Folks in nursing homes. People of all ages in the workplace. Separated from Christ forever. And Paul says, I need your prayers that I would be reminded I'm an ambassador. See, right now as I write this to you, I can say I'm an ambassador. And we could all say the same thing. As we sit here, could you tell me that you're an ambassador for Christ? Yes or no? Do you always live like it? Isn't it easy to have your mindset get on things below? And in the midst of your busyness and doing your job and doing this and that and going out to make a living and taking care of the kids and on and on, you lose sight of your eternal purpose and you get fixated on the temporal and you stop representing Christ. You stop speaking forth for Christ, which is what ambassadors are supposed to do. If my eyes are fixed on heaven, if I've got the helmet of salvation on, I am having my thoughts guided by eternity, and eternity will drive me to communicate the gospel to as many people as possible. Does that make sense? So Paul is saying, would you pray for me that I would keep on receiving that helmet day after day, moment by moment, that that would be mine? Why would this be hard? Think of Paul's life. Was he immune from anything difficult? No, it's the exact opposite. Read 2 Corinthians. Look in chapter 4 when he talks about how he was perplexed but not despairing. The Greek words there mean no way. <laughs> I'm in a situation where there's no way. This is impossible. But then his next phrase is, but not despairing. Not absolutely no way. It appears like there's no way if I'm looking at this from human perspective, but if I put on the helmet of salvation, there is a way. And he goes back and forth with those kinds of words all through 2 Corinthians 4, and then he reminds himself of the fact that he's focused on things eternal. This is temporary, this suffering, these challenges. And in chapter 5, he says, you know, my, my tent is groaning. That's, that's a reality. My body is dying, and someday it'll be over. But what I really need to be concerned about is when I stand before the bema seat of Christ, and when he judges me, I want to know that my life counted. That's the helmet of salvation. And even Paul says, would you pray for me that I'd put it on every day? It's not easy. Paul kept asking for prayer. Why? He was human. He had fears. He didn't enjoy pain, imprisonment. Do you think his flesh wanted to go through all this hardship? Read 2 Corinthians 12 where he says, I sought the Lord three times asking him, would you please take this thorn in my flesh away? God, please. Please. And then there's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at this prayer, this awareness. He, he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction. That's being caught between a rock and a hard place, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. You catch that? Paul is saying, I was so discouraged, so overwhelmed, so, can I say the word, depressed, that I wanted to die. 
I thought it was over. I didn't think I could take another step. You ever been there? Indeed, we had the sentence of death. He doesn't say outside of us. He's not said, we had the sentence of death from the Roman government. My head has been chopped off. No, no, he says the sentence of death was where? Within us. This is intense. Why did God let that happen? So that we would not, what is it? Trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. There's that helmet again. God, they may kill me, but you'll raise me. I'm fixing my mind on eternal salvation. There's a day where I'm going to be glorified and nobody can stop that. And so as hard as this is, when the helmet's on, I can persevere. He says, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. Intercessory prayer enabled Paul to put on and keep on the helmet of salvation in the evil day. How about us? Do we need it? If Paul needed it, I think we need it. I don't assume that Paul woke up every morning thinking about heaven. I don't. You're going, why are you up in the pulpit then? Sometimes I wake up in the morning concerned about my back. Sometimes I wake up in the morning concerned about finances. Sometimes I wake up in the morning concerned about my mother-in-law. There's a lot of things that are in my mind when I first wake up. Is it always heaven? No. How about you? Is it always heaven? You're not answering me. Is this? No? Help me. I'm up here all alone now. Don't make me feel like I'm isolated. Oh, thank you. I finally got one. That's good. Listen, Paul had a real life with real problems. I do too. So do the rest of the pastoral staff. So do all of our lay elders. We're not superhuman. We're people who desperately need to have the mind of Christ, who desperately need your prayer support. If Paul needs it, we all do. I think of Martha and Mary. It's so easy to become like Martha, isn't it? To engage in ministry, 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 day and night, to work hours and hours and hours and hours. Just go, 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 go. It's so easy to go there. So many people, so many details, so many needs, phone calls, emails, text messages, social media, conferences, meetings, administration. So busy giving, giving, giving to meet the needs of others and not slowing down like Mary to say, God, for me to do that, I have to receive first. Please fill me. Please take over my mind. Please help me to have a heart devoted to things eternal. So Paul wanted prayer that he'd put on the helmet of salvation. And you would think he would also include the sword of the Spirit, wouldn't you? And he sure does. Look at the request he makes. Go back to verse 19. And pray on my behalf that what? utterance, we'll get into that word in a moment, may be given to me in the, what? Opening of my mouth, to make known with what? Boldness. The what? And look in the middle of verse 20. That in proclaiming it, I may what? Speak boldly. He says, I'm an ambassador, all right? I'm thinking that way now. You keep praying that I will always have that mindset that I'll never get my eyes on me. It'll always be about my king. I'm always about the kingdom. It's all about that. I'm seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's not about anything else, but I also need the right words at the right time. <laughs> this is the Apostle Paul saying that. Wouldn't you think by now he would know all the right words? He's been a Christian now for 25 to 30 years, 25 years anyway. He's been studying the Bible. He was a Pharisee. He knows the word. And he's saying, I don't always have the right words to say, and I'm not always, I'm not always bold. Does that shock you? Do you realize there's times that I don't even know what to say? Don't look at me that way. He goes, no, you never shut up. We know. <laughs> no, no, there's times, I, Lord, I don't even know what to say. You ever been there? Lord, I, I need you to give me the right words. And there's times I know what to say and I choose not to. Anybody else? 
The Spirit of God is telling me, directing me to go share the gospel with someone. I'm going, ah, you know, they look busy right now, and I really can't do it, and I've got so much to do. I've got to get moving on here. You know, Lord, let's send someone. Here I am, I send, you know, Dawn. Right? Paul says, uh, I'm an ambassador, but I need utterance. That's the word logos. I need content. I need specific content. Paul is saying there's going to be a given conversation I'm going to have with somebody, and in that moment, I need the exact content. That's what the sword of the Spirit is. I'm pulling out specific words, very pertinent, properly interpreted, properly applied truth from the whole belt. Lord, I need you to direct me to the exact truth I need to say. Give me the content. That's what he's saying. And then he says that in the opening of my mouth, that Greek phrase there refers to the initiation of the act. Paul is saying, once I have the content, I've got to be willing to say it. You notice how that is? You're, you want to share the gospel with someone? What's the most difficult thing to do? Start the conversation, right? Paul is saying, I need the Holy Spirit for that. Would you pray for me? But Paul, you're an apostle. You're a spirit-filled, gifted man. You have led who knows how many to Christ. Paul says, I know, but every day it's a battle. And I need prayer. He says, I want to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. The mystery is something that was not revealed in the past that God has now made known. You can't figure this out on your own. God has to reveal it. And I want to make that known. I want to cause others to understand. I want to be able to enable others to comprehend. I want to do everything I possibly can to give the right words in such a way that this other person, as the Spirit opens their eyes, it can make sense to them. I want to do my part. And I want to do that with boldness even though it will require danger, perhaps. It might be like that time he went into that city and they stoned him and left him for dead. And some people think that might have been when he actually died. And that might have been 2 Corinthians 12 when he went up and had the vision of heaven that God had to give him a thorn in the flesh to make him humble. We don't know exactly, but all of a sudden he rises up. And what does he do? He goes back into the same city where they just killed him. Where did he get that kind of boldness? It was from God. That's the Spirit. He says, I want to be like that all the time. I'm tying into the metaphor here, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, the spoken truth of God. Give me the right content. Give me the initiatory act. Give me the boldness so I can proclaim the mystery clearly, and I'm going to say it. You know, Paul is saying he wasn't naturally eloquent. He says that in other places. He didn't always know the right words to say. In fact, in, Second Corinthians, or in Colossians 4, 3 and 4, he talks about that. He did not have within his flesh a natural drive to go out and share the gospel. He was compelled from the outside. Anybody know what you're talking about here? Anybody ever feel like that? But Pastor Paul, I'm not a gifted evangelist, and I really don't even have a desire to reach people. Okay, you may not be a gifted evangelist, but the desire side is not necessary. Say what? I don't have the desire to do it? No, you need to be compelled to do it. Because you ought to. See how Paul says that? I ought to do this. This is what I ought to do. If my mind really is fixed on heaven, then I will do it if I am prayerfully taking up that sword. And to that end, I need your help. What's going on here? It's not natural, it's supernatural. You know what the enemy wants you to do? He wants you to shut up. That's what he wants. He wants you to not know enough of the word, to know the right words to say at the right time, to not initiate, and to definitely not do it with boldness. He's telling you to shut up. And Paul is saying, would you please pray that God would enable me to speak up? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what all of us are supposed to do. So as we conclude our study of the armor of God, if we're going to stand firm against the true enemy, our enemy is not other people, it's not someone of a different political party, it's not, we are not, those people are not our enemies. The devil's our enemy, and he's a liar, and he's holding others captive to do his will. We must put on the full armor of God so we can stand firm, and then we must pray like crazy and do that with a great urgency and a great sense of alertness to the situation around us that we're being told to shut up. Is that happening in our culture? Are they telling us to do that in the workplace? 
Are they telling us to do that in the schools? Are they telling us to do that in government? And pretty soon, they're going to tell us to start in the pulpit. Shut up. Don't represent God anymore. And we need the full armor of God, don't we? We need a mind that says, I'm fixed on heaven, and the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's be revealed. So therefore, Lord, you, let, whatever you're going to do, let him do it. I can only do it after I've got the helmet of salvation. I can only persevere through beatings and persecutions and trials and imprisonments and shipwrecks and snake bites and all the other stuff that Paul went through. I will only go through that if my mind is fixed on eternity. Do you pray for me that way? And I will only speak if the Spirit of God can enable my mind to comprehend the right truth for the right moment and to share it with grace. And then he can take that truth and transform the hearts of other people. To that end, I need your prayers. And you need my prayers, right? That's what Paul is saying. Then the church can stand. So what? Let's wrap this up. I put these on your outline so you would have them. My, my first application is here is, would you grow in your relationship with God? I'm not saying just knowledge. You need knowledge of God, but would you grow in your relationship with God? Would you seek to know him when you read the word? Don't just read the Bible to check a box. Read the Bible to know the author. Find out more about him, about what he wants, about what he desires, about all he's done for you, how much he loves you. Know God. Don't just know about him. Know him. Seek to know him. Get on your face before him in the word and in prayer daily and seek to know God. That's the whole point of salvation. Secondly, start standing firm. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remind yourself of what happened when you became a Christian what those elements represent, all that was accomplished for you, how you have truth and righteousness and peace. You have a faith in a God who will always take care of you. And then start taking up the helmet daily. Lord, give me your mind. Help me to see the world the way you see the world. Let me have your worldview. Help me to fix my eyes on heaven. And Lord, give me the words and the boldness to speak them so that others can understand the truth. And then the mystery won't be a mystery anymore when the Spirit opens their eyes and they too receive Christ as Savior and Lord. That's what it's all about, amen? To that end, I want to give you a 30-day challenge. I've mentioned this before. Here's my 30-day challenge. I want you to determine to set aside, if you're willing to do this, two or three specific times each day to pray this way for a month. So the end of September, there's 30 days in September. From the 1st to the 30th of September, choose to set aside two or three would be even better times a day to get on your face before God, isolated from everything else, just you and him, and seek him. And pray for yourself and pray for other believers in this church that we would live this way. Wouldn't that be a cool thing if come October... Our lives are so radically changed. Our relationship with Christ was so deepened. Our love for the Savior, our desire to reach the lost would be so changed that the Spirit of God could do whatever He wanted to do with this church. That's what I want to see happen. So consider that.